This is a guide on how to use the WhisperGen Sterling engine. So the very first step when you come into the lab is to make sure that the exhaust extractor is on. This is the exhaust extractor. Turn it to the on position. Just turn it up slightly. You just need a slight positive suction on the exhaust duct. You'll see the exhaust duct up here. You hear that the extractor is on. The next step is going to be to make sure that the exhaust is actually in the duct and that the pipe itself is all secured and make sure that the insulation tape, the aluminium tape, is uh, covering any gaps and seals. The next step is going to be to make sure that the dump water heat exchanger, that's plumbed in. So that means that this tap line here this needs to be connected. You need to make sure along the length of the hose there's no kinks. So just straighten out any kinks before you turn on the water supply. The next step is to make sure the drain, which is this line here, make sure that that is in fact going down the drain here, because this is an open flow of water. So when we turn on the tap slightly, we will get a flow of water out this drain here. So this is at a low flow rate here. For operating the engine, you can put this up to a high speed for maximum cooling, or any other speed, any other uh, position in between. The final step in the pre-setup is making sure that the condensate drain for the exhaust is also going down the drain here. Because we have an exhaust heat exchanger inside of the engine bay, the exhaust stream gets very cold, so you get a lot of condensate. So that will run down the tube here, come down out the bottom, and it will eventually flow down into the drain out of the lab. So our next step is going to be to take the cover off of the engine. So this fiberglass cover, you'll see two O-ring straps here. So you just pull off the strap on that side, pull off the strap on this side and then you lift the cover off first by tilt it back lift it up and then put it somewhere securely out of the way so as you look at the engine here the first thing you'll see is the main control box all the electronics are inside of here there's nothing really serviceable or anything that will need to be changed as part of normal testing uh, one thing to watch out for Sometimes you might get bad voltage sensor readings. Just make sure that all the connections here are securely attached. And there's nothing loose. Likewise with the main battery connections down here. Verify that they are all in good condition. The next important part of opening up the engine cover is the on-off switch. So this on switch here is what uh, connects and disconnects the battery supply down beneath the engine down here. So only when you flick the switch will you uh, see that there is uh, now power going to the controller and you can actually turn the engine on. So a quick overview of the engine. This is the, this is the engine here, the core block here. This is the combustion chamber on top. So this will tend to get hot during testing. The exhaust duct here will get extremely hot so it's critical that no sensors are lying on top of it. This is the marine heat exchanger, is how the manual refers to it. It's just an exhaust heat exchanger. It can take an open flow of water. Uh, so the purpose of this is to basically pull heat out of the exhaust stream and increase the overall efficiency. On this side, this is the air intake and the fan blower. So it sucks air in here, blows it into the combustion chamber for combustion. Uh, some other important parts are the diesel fuel line here. So if for some reason the system runs dry, you will need to turn on the engine uh, at the controller, go into one of the diagnostic menus, into the fuel bleed. That will activate the fuel pump, which is this small little pump down here. It will make a clicking noise and it may be necessary to get a spanner up here and loosen this. Uh, and you'll let the engine keep running, keep pumping fuel until you get small droplets of fuel coming out up here 
Once you've done that, you can be sure that you've purged the airlocks and you reseal the, uh, reseal the fuel line again. The other important sensors are the flame ionization detector here. You'll see there's a bit of tape around here because there's a gap leading into the combustion chamber. So sometimes you might get very small traces of smoke rising out when the engine is first starting up. That's just due to the glow plug here heating up the uh, combustor. Uh, finally, the exhaust temperature sensor is here. In terms of uh, other sensors, you'll see that I've added in a number of thermocouples here. These are type T thermocouples. I put them into critical points on the engine. Some are in flow uh, at key points. Just refer to the various theses that are on the, uh, the documentation and it will show you exactly where they are. So depending on what you're trying to measure, you'll be getting a temperature and a flow rate across critical points of the engine. So you can see I've got all these sensors in and they're broken out into a harness out here. So this harness here, the end of it, this is what you'll connect onto your data acquisition unit. Likewise, there's a number of flow meters. These are uh, Hubba Control, I think they're uh, DN15s. Uh, they've actually got a built-in thermistor as well as a flow meter. Uh, so they're Carman vortex tail sensors, so there's no moving parts. You've got uh, five wires, three for the uh, sensor. I'm not sure what the color coding is, but you'll basically have signal, power, ground, and then the two, th uh, two thermistor wires. So these two will need to be wired into the data acquisition unit. The most important thing is that the output from the flow meters is a pulse output. So your data acquisition unit will need to have a pulse counter in order to read them. So on the back of the engine, on the two flow loops, we've got the closed loop, which is the main water jacket. There's one flow sensor. And then the second one, sorry, this is actually the open loop. And then the second one down here is the closed loop. So both of those will need to be measured if you're trying to quantify the efficiency of the engine. In terms of other parts of the engine, we have the battery bank down below, so when the engine runs, it will try to charge up the battery bank. If the battery bank is full, the engine will turn on something called a clamp heater. Basically, it's going to dissipate the electrical energy generated internally within the engine. So it's always delivering a nominal thousand watts of power. It is possible to load the batteries externally. Uh, using this inverter that's connected to the batteries and then just an electric resistive heater. That'll act as a, an 800 watt load on the engine, which is its nominal output. Final important thing on the frame is the uh, data acquisition from the actual engine's own controller. So that's a serial cable, I think it's RS-232. Well, actually I believe what comes out of the engine is RS-485. There's a 232 converter in here, and that brings it to 232. And this cable here is what goes into the data acquisition computer in the lab here. So at the back of the engine there, it'll be going into the serial port. So in order to get data from the engine's own controller using the Micromon program, you need to make sure that that cable down here is connected, and likewise that it's connected to the computer over here. And lastly is the fuel header tanks. Uh, so there's diesel fuel, that's where it gets added in, up at the top up there. And likewise there's the coolant, this is for the closed loop. It's a mixture of glycol and water. Both of these tanks are vented, uh, that's critical, it just means that there's a little hole in the cap. Uh, that's just so that when the fuel is actually draining out of the tank or coming into the system, it doesn't cause a vacuum and cause the engine to stall. When the system is being refueled, just it's important to do a quick check, make sure none of the lines are damaged here. This is the fuel line, the white line down here, make sure there's no leaks. And then to fill it up, use the stool or anything that doesn't swivel. You simply take your fuel tank here, your jerry can, wear gloves, glasses, attach the spout onto the uh, fuel tank. Then using the fuel tank, you go on the stool, up to the header tank up here, you unscrew the cap and fill your tank. You only need to go about 90% of the way up, so maybe to around here. Anything else, it's, uh, it's unnecessary. 
Once you're finished, just close up the tank, get down from the engine, put away the stool, and put away your fuel tank again. Uh, try not to store fuel in the lab if you can, so just buy as much as you need. Um, so finally, to actually operate the engine, the procedure is as follows. So we're assuming that the engine is completely off and someone's just come in cold. So the first thing to do again, make sure the extraction system is on. It is, fan is working. We return back into the lab. We turn on the engine at the switch. Controller has come on. We should see a green standby light here. There we go, there's no issues. So the final thing to do now is turn on the external cooling flow. Make sure we're draining. And to start up the engine, we simply hold start. So it's a little difficult to see on the controller. There's a slight issue. Uh, the screen is difficult to read head on. But it's telling us that we're powering up. So what we're going to hear is the engine's coolant pump here will turn on first. So we're going to hear a sort of a buzzing noise. Likewise, eventually, once the glow plug on the engine, this is going to start getting hot. Once the engine starts heating up and it's reached temperature after a couple of minutes, uh, we'll hear the fuel pump turn on. So what we're hearing now, that buzzing, that's just the circulation pump circulating coolant around the closed loop of the engine. Just turning our external water flow back on. After about three minutes, we'll hear a clicking noise. That's the, uh, the pump here, it's a positive displacement pump. So that will start clicking, that means we have fuel running. As I said, that won't happen for a couple of minutes. Uh, then we'll hear kind of a large sort of rumbling noise. I believe that's a thermoacoustic uh, instability or just resonance of the combustion chamber and the exhaust because we have quite a long exhaust on the system. So we'll hear quite a loud uh, noise from the engine. So the flame will run. So after about maybe seven or eight minutes of heating up, the engine will reach uh, sufficient temperature to actually be able to start. So what we'll hear then is the alternator will give the engine a little kick and then we'll actually hear the engine uh, mechanically moving. Uh, at that point then, the engine is operating and it'll take another perhaps 15 minutes for it to reach its uh, nominal power of about one kilowatt. For the sake of demonstration, I'm not going to show that. So at the moment, we're currently still preheating. As I said, that will go on for quite some time. So to shut down the engine in any situation, you simply hold the stop button and the engine will go into normal shutdown. It will typically do a purge. So what we can hear is the, uh, the fan there is picked up. What it's trying to do is cool down the engine. Uh, if the engine is actually has been operating for some time, this process could take up to 10 minutes, uh, which is important if you're here for just a fixed time slot. Keep in mind that the engine has a startup time and a shutdown time. So if you intend to run for an hour, there could be 10 minutes either side of that hour before you can uh, actually leave. That's all that's needed uh, for the operation of the engine, so we're happy that the engine is shutting down here. Uh, once the engine is fully shut down and cooled off, it's important to knock off this switch because over time, the controller will drain down the batteries. So we want to avoid that. Of course, we need to turn off our water line. And once everything is stopped, we'll again turn off the uh, fan extractor. In terms of engine controller data acquisition, you simply turn on the lab PC. Uh, I don't believe it has a password. You'll see straight on the desktop, Micromon release, uh, the shortcut, you just open that up. Provided that our serial cable on the engine is connected, to the engine itself and connected to the computer and that we are reading COM1, then we should get live data from the engine. And we're seeing that now. We have COM link up here. We can see various bits of engine data, the bus voltage, that's the actual battery, the clamp voltage, alternator current, the electrical output, and various temperatures. Uh, 
And that's effectively all we need. If you want to record data from the engine, it's necessary to put in the password. So the password in this case is just password, all lowercase. Once we enter that, we'll see greater functionality and we just simply click start logging. So we want to go into start logging and we want to log everything. So everything here is in the logged column, that's fine. We want to log at one second intervals. By clicking start logging, we are now logging data from the engine. To stop logging, we just go into it, stop logging, we can close down our program. And then our actual data is going to be stored in the following folder here, the Micromon release folder. C, so we'll just create a shortcut. So the data that we've just recorded will be in the main folder on the C drive, and you can see various data files here have been recorded previously. So we can see today's data, 2017, first, January 16th. Go into it, we can see various sets of data here, and this data can just be then imported into Excel. And that concludes all the information needed to operate the MicroGen engine.